a couple of acknowledgements, if I may. Um, we'd like to thank our friend and our co-producing partner, um, WBRU. They've been a, a, a great partner in so many ways and, uh, and we just love working with them and they've done a great job. Um, we'd also like to thank the Carnegie Corporation and Brown University. Um, and I, I'd like to just, since we're a little late, I'd like to go straight to, um, to introduce DeRay. I have a little brief bio here and then we'll turn it over to him. Um, DeRay McKesson is a civil rights activist focused primarily on issues of innovation, equity, and justice. He was born and raised in Baltimore he grad graduated from Bowdoin College and he holds honorary doc doctorates from the New School and the Maryland Institute College of Art. Jeremy McKesson has advocated for issues related to children, youth and families since he was a teen as a leading voice in the Black Lives Matter movement and co-founder of Campaign Zero. DeRay has worked to connect indiv individuals with knowledge and tools and provide citizens and policymakers with common sense policies that ensure equity. He's been praised by President Obama for his work as a community organizer, has advised officials in all levels of government and internationally and continues to provide capacity to activists, organizers and influencers to make an impact. The executive producer and host of Crooked Media's Pod Save the People, please welcome DeRay McKesson. Hello, uh, sorry about the timing issue, everybody. I'm here and excited to be here. So, you know, it's it's fun. I, I talk a lot, uh, but normally about the criminal justice policing work I do, I rarely get to talk about the podcast. Uh, so it's fun to be here and talk about the podcast, excited for questions and pushes. Let me walk you through uh, the things that sort of guided me. Now, the podcast started in 2016. Uh, John Favreau from from Pod Save America now and Crooked uh, called and was like, Duray, you should do a podcast. And I was like, ah, I don't really want to do a podcast. I got a lot of things going on. I want to do a podcast. He's like, no, I think you should do one. I'm like, I'm not going to do one. Cool. Then he calls me like a week later. He's like, Duray, your first date for the podcast is this date. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you're going to do it today. And I'm like, okay, I guess we're doing a podcast. I, at the time, was the chief human capital for the school system. I had a full-time job. It was like a lot. And this was before there were a ton of podcasts. So even my announcement about a podcast was national news. It was like a thing. We were number two on the charts on announcement day uh, nationally, which was really cool. But I was trying to figure out like, what did I want the pod to be? And the pod is four hosts. Uh, we talk for 30 minutes about news that you don't know. And then we do, a and then I do a 30 minute interview. And I'll walk you through sort of the four things uh, that really helped me uh, think through this. Oh, can we, can you enable screen sharing? So the first thing I'll just talk to you, the first is this idea of like, stick to your question. This has been like a guiding thing for me, my entire career. So when I do the work of activism, I'm always chasing the question of like, how do we get to zero? We call it a campaign zero because we're trying to get to zero. So like everything I do is like, how do we get to zero? And with the podcast, the question to, for me was like, how do we tell the truth? Like that was like the thing. It was like, how do I create a space we tell the truth. So the reason that we did the four pieces of news at the beginning was like, you know, there's so much going on every week that like never makes the, it, it's not on CNN, it's not on MSNBC, but people should know. And like, how do we make sure people know what's true? Like, how do we make sure people know about uh, teeth sealings and kids who died from tooth infections and the social justice quilt going around the country and the only black woman who's ever been the head chef at a Michelin rated restaurant. Like how do all these things that like, you might never hear because they won't be on scene. They're not breaking news, but they are things that people should pay attention to. How do we tell that truth? Like that's the thing that guides all the decisions that I make about the pod from the editorial decisions to who we interview to when the interviews at air, like huge. Um, here we go. So like my advice to you, as you think about using podcasts or any of the platforms that are um, that are spoken based is that like stick to your question. I found a lot of people don't have a question, which is why I listen to the pod and I'm like, what am I listening to? Uh, but make sure you have a question. Uh, this question, I don't really hate this question. How do you know it's a success? I hate it, it drives me nuts. 
in my professional life, but for the podcast, it was perfect. Because for me, when I went into it, I said to myself on day one, literally, if any teacher assigned an episode of the podcast as homework or classwork, I won. Like if at any point the podcast becomes a teaching tool, like a like used in classrooms, like that is truly the highest compliment I could ever get. And I'll never forget, we probably had, I don't know, close to 200 episodes now. We've been every week since, um, every week since 2016. Is like, I'll never forget getting the first email from a teacher and then the first email from a student being like, I heard this in class. And I'm like, I did it. I, I like, that is all I set out to do was like, but this question for me was really big. So when uh, people would, you know, the way we do it is that there's a group chat, the four of us put on news and um, we don't talk about the news at all until we get to the podcast recording. And when we get to the recording, we uh, talk about it for the first time. So like, we don't know what people's takes are gonna be, da da da. And only a handful of times that people put things in the chat that I'm like, mm, I don't really think it makes sense to be new. Like, I think this is weird. And the only times I said that are times that I'm like, I don't know if this is teaching. I don't know if this is like helping people understand the world better. Uh, but I always go back to like, if students listen to this where they learn, could teachers use this as a resource? Like, does this open up space or does it close space? Like, though that, that was like how I thought about this question of like, how do I know it's a success? Huge for me. Like, uh, I was like a little kid when the first day we like the first email we got that was like, I use it in my class. I was like, oh my goodness, we did it. We solved all the problems. Uh, the third is that I really do want people to learn, right? So when I think about the interviews, a lot of the interviews are things where like, and this goes into the fourth one is like, we're always teaching. Um, what was really helpful for me, especially in 2016, is that I don't talk to the guests until I interview them. And I legitimately have questions, right? So like, I want my curiosity to come through and I want to model to people that like we can be successful and have questions, right? Because for a lot of people, not knowing is a sign of weakness, but I just didn't think that was true. So there've been a lot of, the first, the second episode we ever did was um, was about the difference between Medicare and Medicaid and I didn't know the difference. So Andy Slavitt, who now has his own podcast called In the Bubble, he's the man, uh, he came on and I was just like, I don't know the difference between Medicare and Medicaid. It was the second episode we ever did. And when I tell you the amount of feedback we got from that episode, I mean, people loved it. People were like, I didn't know either. I was too ashamed to to ask about it. Da, da, da. Like that's been really powerful. So even we had an episode with Mersa Baranaran, hopefully, who is gonna be the next uh she's gonna be the next comptroller of the currency, hopefully. She was on talking about the wealth gap, and one of the things she said, uh, this is in the weeds, but um bank like commercial banks like Bank of America, Wells Fargo they don't make any money in neighborhoods like they are like the amount of money that like everyday people like you and I put in the banks like they're not really making money off the consumer side of it it's the business side of it that they actually make money that's why there's no bank of america in like small towns because like there's no money to be made there um, so she was on talking about how could we actually increase the reach of banking so that like there are no more banking deserts and I'm like, I don't, like I was asking her, like, what can we do? And she was like, DeRay, you know that uh, the post office used to be banks for people. Like, there were a po you could do postal banking all across the country. Post offices are equitably distributed. Post offices are everywhere. Blah blah. And I was like, I didn't know. And the next week, I get a call from Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's office, and she's like, uh, We listened to the episode. The senator listened to the episode. We're introducing legislation about postal banking because of that episode. And like. That is why I made the podcast. I wanted it to be a place where people could come and learn because I knew, especially as an activist, is that people do not take action on things they don't understand. That like, I gotta help them both understand and feel it. And if I can help you understand it, like if I can make logical arguments that help you lead you to a conclusion and make you feel it, which leads you to action, we can do anything. And like, that was actually, that was it. That was, like, those were like the guiding principles. But those are two examples. Another episode we did um, on, uh, there was a kid in DC who, who he was, I think like 10, he cavity becomes a tooth infection. He eventually dies from the tooth infection. And uh, it was completely preventable. So I get these dentists to come on and we talk about the idea that you can seal your teeth, like kids can get their teeth sealed, like their back teeth. 
And the number of uh, messages we got from parents, especially black parents, being like, I didn't know anything about teeth sealants. I didn't know that this was a thing that could be done. And it, you know, it's like those things super matter. We did it, excuse me, recently on, um, on glaucoma because I read an article about racial disparities in glaucoma. So I had this doctor who like leads uh, like eye care awareness across the country. And uh, he comes on and like, who knew glaucoma is the second leading cause of blindness amongst black people that you can't feel glaucoma. So by the time you feel that you're already like, it's too far gone. So you actually, you, that's why if you've been to the eye doctor, they blow those puffs of air in your eye. Um, and that is the test for glaucoma. And, and as you can imagine, eye doctors are not equally distributed across low income communities. There's this whole conversation about eye care. And the number of people who reached out and they were like, you know, I don't get my eye checked every two years because like I got my glasses are fine or I got LASIK or da da da, who like aren't even thinking about glaucoma, haven't thought about it, didn't know that you can't feel it. Cause most people are like, well, if something goes wrong with my eyes, I'll feel it. You won't feel glaucoma. It's pressure building up and you won't be able to feel it until it's like too far gone. And it's those episodes that like, I know we're like adding to the conversation and people are learning things that they wouldn't otherwise learn. And I say this because I think there are a lot of, um, I think there are a lot of podcasts that are really celebrity driven. So like, you're not really learning anything, but the reason that they want people to listen or the reason, the way they get people to listen is that it's like a back-to-back -back of celebrities. And like, we did that at the beginning because I just didn't know any, any, any better. And then it was like, after my like 20th celebrity, it's like, y'all were saying the same stuff. I like, do I really need to know like, well, yeah, for dinner, no, right? Is anybody like going to be better off because like they, we can talk through the stunt scene you did. It's like, nah, I don't know, right? Like that's just that. I'm sure that's somebody's podcast. It's just not mine. And the, the other group of people that are um, a little boring are like the electeds. Not because in the electeds are like a great audience, but let me tell you, most elected officials, they got the same, it's the same thing. They're like, okay, da, 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 da. And you're like, whoo boy. So the stuff you really want to know, they're never going to say on the record. So we sort of veered away from them too. And we like don't really do a lot of those anymore. We do things where like I come to the conversation. I'm like, I'm curious. I think I can learn. We had a, a cold pitch of a book about black love. And I was like, you know what? Book looks interesting. Let's book her. Professor Stewart. Um, we get her on best interview I've done, done in months. I mean, she was incredible. Like it was just the history of black marriage, black love. I literally had no clue. And she talked about things like one thing she said that I'll never forget it is she was like, um, she was like the federal government after emancipation essentially required black families black people to get married and i was like why like who knew that the federal government cared about black marriage at all she's like Dre, that's the rub they did not care but forcing black people to get married allowed the federal government to say that because men were the head of households that the government had no responsibility for the kids and women and you're like who knew another thing she talked about in the book and on the pod was we obviously know lynchings are awful uh, and a bad part of our history. What I didn't know is that uh, white people used to actually cut the genitalia off of black men and they would keep them as like trophies in houses and stores and display. I mean, she taught me so much and it was a cold pitch and I had to be open to that, but it goes back to this idea that like I wanted people to learn and I needed to model learning so that like other people would feel okay with it. And the last one is this reminder that we're always teaching. So the, the way we talk about things is teaching, the way that we, uh, like who we put on our platforms is teaching, the way that we have tough ideas, you know, on the, with the four of us talking, the way that we disagree or agree, like we're modeling for people. And if there's anything that I've worried about, some of the podcasts I've seen coming up is that like, uh, sometimes people aren't aware that they are teaching, that like the way you talk about that, the way you joke about that, the way that you introduce that is actually communicating a set of things about power and people's values that we actually just have to be really mindful of. And then like, you know, so I think about early in the podcast, we stopped saying the word crazy years ago because people were like, this this comes with a, a whole implication about power. So we always say wild. We're like, that was wild. Da, 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 da. Uh, but there are a lot of things like that that like we had to be open to learning, you know, or people email us after a podcast and say, you know, I would the less comment I got about something so I was mad about was um I was I was complaining about Space Force, like the the thing that Trump did where there's like the whole group of um the federal government now that like is truly called Space Force. And he was like, DeRay, that was, it needed to happen. It didn't need to happen that way, blah, blah. But it was like a much more nuanced take on it. And I was very unnuanced. I was like, Trump did it, it didn't make sense. And he was like, yeah, the way he did it was, 
was bad and like you know there are a million things that were wrong with it but like the resources did it and it's like those sort of nuanced pushes are actually really helpful and we try to respond to people when they reach out about these things because we want the listeners to know that like we really do care and we actually i take a lot of pitches for guests from people listen because it's like this is your space too right i can probably get whoever we want but it's actually cool that like you were like did you talk to this person or you know i think about um i don't know if you've seen i care a lot on netflix about elder abuse i tweeted about it and then the people there's like a big elder abuse company was like Dre, because of your tweet we put together a resource kit cool and now we're gonna have somebody on the pot about elder abuse because i saw that netflix thing and i'm like oh my god we got to talk about this so like i try not to be too rigid uh, in how we do the interviews and how we put together the schedule because like I'm always learning and the pod is actually a great excuse for me to get in front of, to talk to somebody who I would never otherwise have the capacity to talk to. So I'll stop there. It's been great to be here. I'm excited for questions or pushes. Um, you know, the pod, you know, people don't see the gazillion hours of work that it takes uh, to put the pod together. And, you know, we record an hour worth of audio for the interview that our editors every single Sunday night um actually edit down to sound like a 30 minute conversation so shout out to them when we started doing that people said that we were crazy they were like this is too much work you'll never do this every day every week and and like we actually do you know um and we do and it's dope and like it is there are other podcasts that actually do a similar format now because of that uh but when we when we did it it was one of those things that like I thought it was right. We had, I found the people who were able to do it and like we made it work. Thank you. That's great. Um, so Bill Lenz and Brock Wilbur, the people you're talking about who do that work on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. And they are like, Dre, give me the files. I'm like, I'm not done. I need to record this thing. <laughs> now, when you, when you do that, I just, uh, that we're taking questions at this point from from all of you not i'm just filling time here while we're getting your questions but i am curious about something uh so when you're doing that when you're distilling it down to 30 minutes are you trying to get the same feeling that you get at in the early part of the podcast where you're just talking about news stories among each other is just very friendly and relaxed and you know that so it's interesting What's interesting is that we actually don't like uh, Brock. Brock actually does the he he chooses what parts to cut. I don't. Oh, OK. So like I used to be more involved in the beginning. So Brock's probably the fourth producer we've had. So if we get a new producer, then we norm around like, you know, there's some like unspoken rules, like don't always cut this person. You know, like there are four of us. Right. So like try to try to cut pieces of everybody. So it's not so there's not like a weird imbalance. Right. Um, we've got the four of us have gotten better at not talking if we don't have something to say so then you just don't have to cut it right so like if, if it's obvious and we just like we won't echo the person so that Brock doesn't have to be in a weird position to cut um, but we actually don't like we they figured out like Brock has figured out a good cadence with our voices that like I don't even listen to it before it goes live anymore and sometimes I'll send notes being like make sure you cut that whatever was said mm -hmm. yeah, there sure. like don't do yeah. that uh, but it's cool like they actually do it and then, so, and then I, I just, I noticed uh, just a couple of things that um, I'm wondering about. One, one is the advertising. Now, you know, this, you got to raise revenue and so on. But I noticed that you, um, you seem to be pretty selective. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm projecting here, but you seem to be pretty selective about who your advertisers are. As I see, if you look, if you look at uh, Crooked Media, there's a lot of, a lot of advertisers and they're not all on your podcast. Do you have a say in, in who is gonna be uh, in, the, in the middle break? Yep, so every week from Crooked, I get like a list of new potential advertisers. And then they come, by the time they get to me, they've already been vetted. So some of them will say like, this other pod passed on so-and-so, but we wanted to know if you would. Mm. So then I'm like, mm, yes or no. Um, and then we have some, there's some things that like, I just don't make sense for me as an activist. So like, there are a lot of those. And then some of the ones that are a little more complicated are that, you know, you know, obviously, you know, podcast world is um, the podcast reads for other podcasts, because sometimes it'll be like, mm, actually, like, 
that podcast is weird and I would never listen to it. So like, I don't want to tell our listeners to listen to it. So sometimes I have to like listen to an episode before I like shout out some random pod, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, there's a tease at the end for a cross, a cross promo for other podcasts. Yeah. Sometimes. And yeah, yeah. We've been doing, um, uh, Ronan, the, uh, the Ronan Fair, the, the Pharaoh podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's when we did, you know, we've been doing a lot recently, but, but you'll, I mean, you haven't seen the list of things we said no to. <laughs> so oh, I'm like, sure. I'm sure that's what I'm asking you. We get pitched on this. <laughs> it's like, ah, I don't really think that's. <laughs> well, we have something here from, uh, from one of our, uh, one of our attendees. Do you pre-interview? And if so, I what's the pre-interview like? I don't pre-interview. So Brock, the Brock gives me like a cheat sheet of questions for every interview, mm -hmm. um, where he might talk to them or might talk to their PR people or might get the he might get the book and read a chapter or something like that. I, I don't I don't actually do them because I want it to be fresh. You know what I mean? Yeah, but no doubt the person you're interviewing knows the general topic, the reason you're interviewing them. Like so we'd like to talk to you. Yeah, about but sometimes it'll X. go. Sometimes, you know, because I am curious. So like, I think about one where it was, we veered. Um, so like the, the, the book on black love, mm -hmm. you know, I read this, so Brock, Brock had some pro questions and like, she wrote the book. So there were some things in the book that I'm just fascinated by that Brock didn't know I was fascinated by. So like when she got on, I'm like, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. And if they're not ready or like, if, if they're weird, then like, we just cut it. Right. Like, and I tell people be, like, this is not a gotcha podcast. So if you screw up or stammer, then like, we'll just edit it out in the end and you'll come out perfectly. You know? The, uh, the same person here is, uh, is curious about, um, this is all about preparation, I think. Uh, so when you, you do your research before the interview, um, you, you then try to figure out, well, what are some of the questions I might ask? Um, it, so that's all preparation, you know, sort of making sure that you're not going in totally cold. But as you said, you like it to feel spontaneous. So probably a lot of that, you know, is dispensed with pretty much as soon as the conversation starts. This is a guess, but. Yeah, I don't do a ton of prep. The prep is really saying yes to you on the podcast. So we get this long list of people that want to be on and we say no to most people because we have a bank of, like it's already, you know, we already got a lot of people in the bank and da 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 da. So I don't want to interview you and then never air it because then you're going to be mad. So like we say no to a lot of people. So by the time I yeah. said yes, I'm curious about something or sometimes like Black Home is a great example where like I sent Brock a message being like, I just read this thing about glaucoma. Can you find somebody who knows something about glaucoma? And sometimes we, um, you know, I, I think about, I did, I did did a couple interviews recently that like we probably aren't going to be able to use like they weren't able to talk about the content in a way that made sense so we might bring them back but like you know i tried and like i'm not going to put something on where like it just doesn't make sense you know um so that gets a little complicated sometimes but but the the pre-work is really saying yes like that is actually the like hardest thing i understand i just because there are makers out here who are, are part of this conference. Um, one of the things that I think gets people a little bit nervous when they're starting to think about podcasting is the comp competitive environment in which podcasts live, which is huge. I mean, even, even within the family of Crooked Media, you know, there's like about 15, 18 podcasts, and then there's the rest of the world. Does that stuff enter into your thinking about how you're going to make the program succeed or do you or the podcast succeed or do you do you just say, you know what, I can't worry about that. We've just got to do our mission. I think I'm probably not the best, you know, because I was the second podcast on the Crooked Network, we would just stay longer than everybody but Pod Save America, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't I don't think about it in that way. I also I know that we offer something that you can't get anywhere else, right? Like we did it first, we did it better, we did it, you know, so like I didn't, I remember when Pot Save America started, is the reason that we don't, we like, I they do a play-by-play -play of Trump, that's what they did every week, mm -hmm. twice a week. You didn't need a black version of that, like what, I don't have that much to say about that man, right? So like I knew we weren't going to do a play-by-play -play of the Trump news, like I knew that. So then it was like, what can we do? And I was like, oh, I think we can do the news you don't know. And like, there'll always be news you don't know. Like that is, it's always gonna be there. Uh, and I and I did that intentionally so that when Trump wasn't president, I didn't have to like figure out a new format of the show. You know what I mean? It just, it does what it does. And we learn every week. And and that was actually really important to me. So yeah, um, yeah. 
So no, not, I don't think about a lot of competition. I do, I think, again, the biggest thing is that there are, produ the podcast world is like book celebrities, celebrities drive traffic. Like that's sort of like the formula. We don't do that. And um, I think that, and this is the organizer in me that understands that one is the biggest number that I don't need. I mean, the podcast as well. So like it does. But like my goal isn't to like have a million listeners a week if the content's bad, right? Like that's not like a, like the question I was chasing wasn't how to have a podcast with a million listeners every day. It was like how to make a difference. And like sometimes those things might yeah. be at odds. So we do, we do ads and we do, you know, it's because I've been at Cricket for so long, it is like a little, it's just different, right? It's one of those things where like, um, at the beginning, I was on Pod Save America once a week, like cross promoting, and and now they're like a million podcasts. So that's not just pod, you know. It's like there's a host of things that are different, just because like I've grown up with the net with the network. Um, but it's cool. It's like fun to see it grow, and it is. It's crazy. It is crazy to be like I remember. Like I remember when we did. I interviewed Edward Snowden for the third episode of wow. the pod, and because I know it, I know Snowden, and um, we had no lawyer. We had nothing. I mean, it was like, and I remember there's like this clause in the Espionage Act that says that like um, being a platform for state secrets, you can be liable for the secret. So we had to get all these like pro bono lawyers to like listen to the recording before we put it on. Because at one point he said, I think this made it. I think I didn't. I think we didn't cut it. But at one point he says like. Um, there's like a site off the coast of blah, 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 where like all phone calls and all phone calls in the country recorded. Like he said something like that. And like the lawyers like didn't know if we could, air, you know, like, so it's crazy to, to, I mean, now Cricket's like a whole thing and there are all these employees and it's like, a, but back then it was like the three guys, me and like our friends who were lawyers, you know? Uh, so it is, <laughs> it is sort of nuts to see it, uh, to see it become what it's become. This is a good question. Um... You know, there, there's a loyal audience. They interact with you all the time. How does that affect the show? The the interaction you have with people who listen? Uh, listeners are great. You know, I, 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 I meet a lot of listeners. People are like, I listen to the pod. And you're like, thank you so much. Um, listeners are great. You know, it's the coolest thing about the listeners, though, is to know that, like, we're helping people understand content that they otherwise might have skipped in the given week. And for the hosts, like for the four, the contributors, what's cool about the four of us is that we learn every week too. So like we all leave every week being like, oh, we like in hindsight, we know much more about what's happening in the world because we have to talk about it every Sunday and having to talk about it every Sunday equips us. And we want that to like also bleed over into the community and it does. So like we never, there's not another place where like you are getting the conversation you're getting on the pod and we know that. So if anything, we are like, if there's a growth plan for us, we're trying to figure out how do we bring more people into the fold? Like how do we get more people to like uh, get on us and understand us? But once we get you in, we got you, you know? No, that's great. Um, what are your favorite uh, podcasts that you you admire you listen to i wish i listened to more podcasts uh, <laughs> the last podcast that like really i loved it so much that i went and um i like met the producers i like tweeted about them like can i meet you guys uh was um a podcast called running from cops so it's about uh cops a tv show and it is i mean cops is like sort of it was canceled and then sort of came back mm -hmm. um but brilliant podcast. Like I thought that they, you know, we have a narrative podcast now with Lemonada, uh, like the organization I help lead, um, called the untold story about policing. And I didn't, I didn't really believe it. So like there's true crime, which you already know, yeah. but I hadn't really seen like narrative investigative, not crime, like not trying to solve a crime. I just hadn't seen one of those podcasts. And running from cops, I thought that it was flawless from like start to finish. I was like, they nailed it. These people are geniuses. Da, da, da. So when we started our narrative podcast on Lemonada, like running from cops was my, that was my gold. I was like, this is, they got it. So if you ever have any questions about cops or how weird it is or how bad it is, or the, um, what's the other show? It's cops and then um, re, uh, something not, what's the other show like cops? There's like another there's another like Sorry. show like cops where like cops have access to they like arrest people. Oh my God. The people are, the cops on that show are like famous. Cause it's like one set of, they follow. Oh, you know, live, live. Live. Yes. What is it called? Live PD apparently. Live PD, <laughs> I don't yes, know. Yes. It, so it's like, yes. yeah. 
Oh, did somebody say that in the chat? Yeah, Live PD. Yeah. Yes, Live PD. So, uh, so running from cops is about cops and about Live PD. And like, you learn so much. So like, one of the things I'll tell you on the, on their podcast is, um, so they cops cops has been running for a long time. They got see I told see Alize running from cops. So there's this. Um, there's this so cops was getting a lot of negative feedback for uh, like the the racial disparities in the criminal justice system were not being present in the show. So it was like overrepresenting people of color being arrested, right? So what they did is that they fixed it. So like it does represent it right proportionally, but what they in fixing it, they front loaded the black people to be arrested before the first commercial break. And you're like, oh my god! I mean, it is you gotta run it from cops was was incredible. Like truly one of the best podcasts I've ever listened to. Oh, um, I, I wanted to I wanted to talk about um, again this just thinking about makers thinking about sort of how they're going to how they're going to make things work. What about um, what about the frequency of the issue of the podcast? How critical is it that it comes out once a week? Uh, because I've talked to some podcasters who say, you know, um, the best I can manage is like once a month or every other week or something like that. Does that make a difference in, in you think, attracting an, an audience? I don't know about attracting the audience. It definitely, you know, I will tell you that we record every Sunday night at eight. And it is really, um, it's a testament to how much I love the pod because my weekends are always complicated because like I can't really go to dinner on Sunday. I can't really do like <laughs> eight o'clock, eight to nine is always this weird, it's like such a weird chunk of time to be blocked off. Um, but we make it work and it works and people, we've recorded while we've traveled the world and da da da. So like that is cool. I think um, the reason we do it every week is that there is so much, there's so much you don't know that happened in a given week. That like when we when we take off for a week, we're like struggling because we can only bring one piece of news, right? So like as long as there will be news that doesn't make the mainstream, we will always do the pod. Uh, I it is I have to remember to love it. Sometimes. Like we've just done it, we did it, right? Like we the formula got it. Da-da. So it's no longer like it's it's no longer like the thing that I wake up to do. It is the thing that I do because it builds my skills and builds the skills of a of a set of people who want to be in the community, right? So like every week I get off the call and I'm like, oh my goodness, that was so smart. Especially because we don't talk about, we don't talk about the news. I don't know what people feel about the news until we talk about it. So people will come and have a take. And I'm like, never thought about that. I'm like, that was brilliant. Yep, that was great. You know, like, and that, that is what keeps the podcast going for me and has made me like not stop it or shut it down. You know, like that's the thing for me that I'm like, this is dope. So would your, would your advice to somebody new be, you know, to try to have the discipline of issuing it on a regular basis, see where that takes you. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm just wondering if that you'd yeah. recommend that. My advice to you would be like, think about um, how often you have content that you think will move the audience. So for us, because we do the news that doesn't, the news you don't know that's about recent justice, unfortunately, endless content at our disposal, right? So like, we can always find something. Sure. But like, don't the moment that you have to force the content, you, like it just is yikesy. Like that, the listeners can hear it. Um, mm. That's what I thought was mm. so good about running from cops is like it was. I wanted more episodes, but like their gift was knowing when to stop. They stopped. They like they told a story and they stopped. Right, and like I think there are a lot of podcasts that keep going because they feel like they owe it to people. And did it. it's like do your thing and stop. We keep doing ours because like there's still news and it's still stuff to talk about. But the moment that I ever felt like. Mm, we don't need this then like i did you know we've won every war we could win blow like i don't we've done it we've done the things now it's like how do we keep doing it in a way that allows our community to access something that they otherwise wouldn't know and deray i haven't heard all 200 of the podcasts i haven't heard that many at all but i have heard enough to admire something that you've done at least in the last several and that's it, it i monologue is too strong a term but it's just you start by just giving thoughts just what you're thinking as you begin the podcast and then you move on to the to the news and and i was just wondering is that i mean how do, how does one get ready for that it would seem to me that if i were to do it like after two episodes i'd have nothing to say at the beginning i'd wonder oh what am i going to talk about now yeah, it's funny. Uh, funny you ask is that that is probably um, 
if there was something I would probably redo about the podcast, it would be not doing the piece of advice at the beginning of every episode. Not because I don't like it, but like 200 episodes in, I got that much advice. You know, like I'm like, <laughs> literally like that is, and Brock will tell you, sometimes that will delay the podcast. Like that will slow everybody down because like, I'm, I'll have to think like, what am I saying? Like, I've already said it, you know, 200, like every week, <laughs> I overestimated my ability to be inspirational. So. Uh, so it, that is probably the only homework I have in a given week. I'm like, let me find a lesson. Duray, what is the lesson? Like, what did you learn this week or therapy or whatever it is? Uh, so it's hard. It is, I would, I would have, I think in hindsight, I could have set the expectation of once a month or something, but once a week is a killer. <laughs> sometimes it has made me, like one of the ones that I'll never forget is um, you have to, what was it? You um, can't be a cheerleader if you don't watch the game that there are a lot of people who like, who say that they support you and da da da, but like you actually can't be a cheerleader if you don't watch the game. And like watching the game is actually a big part of it, right? So the people I love, I try to like, I will follow their stuff. I'll go to their talk. I read the book. I like, I'm actually like, I what, you what you're doing, because like, that's the only way I can be a good cheerleader is, is if I watch the, if I watch the game, right? And a lot of people who will say they're showing up for you, they say that, but they have seen none of the game. Mm. And like, that was one that I, that came to me because I like needed to say something for the episode and it came to me. Um, so they have been, so that segment has actually pushed me to be more reflective than I probably would be every week. Cause it is every week. <laughs> uh, but I, but yeah, I, most weeks, probably every week now I dread it. I'm like, what am I going to say? I don't know. Oh my God. It's very, it's very, it's very engaging. It's the best. Uh, it's a nice way to start the podcast, I think. Thank you. It is. Um, speaking of the archive, 200 episodes. What about tapping the archive? Have you, have you, you and your team thought about that going into the archive and pulling the best, uh, like say the book interviews or the things that are still, or a lot of things are still timely, even though they're old, right? Um, yeah. Have you we, thought about that? People sort of. Yeah, not not seriously. Like we thought about it for anniversaries or like if we take a break to do mm -hmm. greatest hits. Um, but like not, I don't know. I, I haven't really thought about it. If even if they have, I have not. So I, I, can, <laughs> I can say that honestly, I have not thought about it. And we've only ever taken out we've taken off for like Thanksgiving, Christmas. We've been pretty I mean, it's been a pretty consistent run, you know. That's pretty remarkable. Um well, we're getting near the end. Um, you've been very nice. I um, understand uh, that this is like the most pressured time of the week for you. So we really appreciate you being with us today. Um, and uh, and I'd like to thank everybody who's been here. Um, uh, it's been uh, delightful. I hope you feel you've learned some things, gotten inspired about moving forward in, in what is, I think, one of the more remarkable ways of people communicating with one another uh, using the power of the human voice uh, in an intimate setting, getting people to think, um, getting people to, to emote and, uh, and feel as though we, uh, we all have something of value that we are sharing as, as, a, as a group. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and thank you again to, <laughs> to WBRU and, uh, and to everyone who's put this together. It's been a great privilege. My honor to be here. And, um, and everybody, I hope you listen to the pod. If, if there are some cool things that you uh, want us to cover, I know one of the questions that people put in was like, what source is, like, what do you follow? I, I do, because we do this every week, I do follow a lot of news things. So like Flipboard, um, Smart news is one of my secret weapons. Mm -hmm. All tech news, if you know all tech news, that's another hidden gem in the news in the news space. Uh, so I like do look at a lot of those things because um, it is like hard. To, sometimes, sometimes, like even the news aggregators, like the major ones, only cover the news that really already hit the like hit the mainstream. And because I'm looking for something else. So one of the things we need to do next, um, I, I'm trying to find a guest on amputation. So there was a really good article about uh, black, black people's limbs get amputated more than white people's limbs, interestingly. Um, 
So we're going to find a guest around that. But like, if you know some cool news aggregators, like I'm always looking for a secret news aggregator. So like, if you know something great, let me know, because I'm always looking. Uh, I'll stop rambling, but great to be here. See you later. Okay. Thank you, Duray. Bye.